Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Our message this week is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth and is entitled, Flee from Idols. We will look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 22. As always, you can download the Life Notes from our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, let's hear from the pastor. Go ahead and have a seat, and uh, as you're getting settled in, if you want to take your Bible or Bible app and open to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's where we're going to be today, 1 Corinthians 10, and if you don't have a Bible, there's some Bibles in the chairs in front of you, you can find 1 Corinthians 10 on page 1137, and you can follow along that way. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I've been spending some time getting ready for this message, and I've been noticing something that I think pertains to our passage, and that is the, the amazing amount of warning labels that exist in our world. Uh, I don't know if you've, if you've noticed that before, and I don't know what it was that pushed it over the edge to me, but I think it was an Amazon package that I got a few weeks ago. I bought this, it's pretty small, this battery pack to charge my phone while I'm traveling, like this USB thing. It is not very significant, and yet the box came completely completely stickered up with warning labels about fire hazards. And I mean, it looked like it would be like sure and sudden death for me and my family if I brought this box inside. It was extreme. And I opened it up, I'm like, it's just a little battery. And yet these, these warning labels are all around us. And some of them like that seem so ridiculous, so overboard. And then there's others that you look at and you go, why does this warning label need to exist? Who is actually trying this? And, and there's, there's some of those that exist out there. Uh, I saw a picture of this one. It was on this old uh, ATV gas tank, and it was right there by the, the cap that you would unscrew, and, and it would say, do not use lit match to check fuel level. <laughs> and, and I had so many thoughts in the moment, like, who's actually trying that? But I'm like, okay, we didn't always have flashlights on our cell phones in our pockets 24-7. But then I'm also disappointed this existed before the YouTube era, so there's no videos of people trying this, unfortunately, for our entertainment. But, but another one stands out. A, a few years ago, I bought a new sunshade for my windshield for my car, and, and on it was this big warning label, do not operate vehicle with sunshade in place. <laughs> Which again, seems ridiculous until you're in Arizona in July and, and you're like, well, what if I just have like most of it in there to get out of the sun? There's, there's a point of desperation. You're like, I just got to get out of the sunlight. But see, not all of them are that way. There's some warnings that exist. You're like, we actually do need that. We don't have awareness of that danger and that risk, and so we need that. Growing up on, on the lake here, there is always this cultural awareness of the danger of carbon monoxide from exhaust. And, and every boat in, in, you know, that exists out there has these big warning labels. And, and that's important because there's nothing to tell you that's dangerous until you're like, I'm sleepy. Yeah, it's because you're dying. That's why you're sleepy. It's not because it's nice. But there's nothing inherently to tell you that's dangerous. So we have to use warning labels. We have to teach people. There has to be awareness of this. I also think about this time uh, several years ago. I was in Hawaii. My wife and I were on vacation, and we're, we're hiking up the coast. And we come down this hill, and there's this beautiful opening in this bay. And there, in the midst of everything, there's this beautiful beach. And I go, man, we got to get in. The, the, the weather's warm. The beach looks great. And we round the corner, and there's this sign. It's this wooden sign, like hand-carved with information telling about this dangerous rip current at this beach. And, and it, you know, do not swim, and it goes into detail. And below it were tally marks of every fatality at that beach. And about three quarters of the sign was just tally marks. And so we did what reasonable people did, and we didn't get in the water. We're like, hey, you know, we'll take pictures and remember it that way instead of remembering it from, you know, the lifeguard boat or, you know, the morgue. Um, and so... <laughs> So there's some of those that exist out there that we need those warnings because we don't see the danger on our own. And today as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to see a, a spiritual warning that maybe we wouldn't see on our own. We're going to see a, a, an area of our life spiritually that, that we get a warning label of, hey, you may not see this as a danger, but it's right in front of you. And that is the risk of idolatry. See, all throughout the Bible, we hear it talked about, but here in 1 Corinthians, we're given warnings and explanation about the, the risk of worshiping idols. And so we're going to spend our, our time together today looking at this risk and going, hey, what's this have to do with our life today? But before we get to Scripture, let's do some definitions and some groundwork to make sure we, we all are on the same page with what this means. And the first thing that we have to know is that idolatry is worshiping and serving anything above God. 
That's kind of the, the basic definition. Anything that has a greater priority or importance, anything that gets more of our time, our energy, our commitment, our money, our devotion, more than the place of God in our life may be an idol. And see, to understand this further, we have to understand that, that all of us were created as worshipers. We will spend our life worshiping. That's how God has wired and created us as people. And ultimately, we were, we were created to worship him to have relationship and community with him. And, and anytime we aren't worshiping him, we're pouring our devotion and worship into something else. That's why when, when we're not following and worshiping God, we're chasing after things. We feel this void or this longing in our life that just can't seem to be filled because it was designed to be filled by our creator. And so anytime we put something in that place that isn't God, that's an idol that we're serving and worshiping and following instead of God. And so to understand this for more fully, let's kind of do a little, a little history lesson on idolatry because this has been a, an issue from the beginning of time for all humanity. We see it all throughout scripture going back to when God gave the 10 commandments. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, we see this. Uh, you don't have to flip with me. I'm gonna quote some of it here, but Exodus 20, God's giving his people the 10 commandments. These are the, the 10 kind of mileposts, uh, instructions, guardrails, if you will, for how to live their life. And the very first one just says, you shall have no other gods before me. It's pretty direct, pretty clear. There's no room for idols. There's no room for worshiping anything except God. But we as people are dense, so he reiterates in the second commandment. Verse four, he says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that's in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them it's pretty direct that, that we're not to worship idols. It, it's very clear. God's like, hey, this is important. Out of the 10 most important things, I can tell you, we're going to use two of them to say that I need to be the most important thing in your life. And the reason for that is because he understood that his people were so prone to worshiping idols. All throughout scripture, we see them fall into this trap of worshiping things that weren't their creator, that weren't the God of the Bible, that weren't the creator of everything, but were created deities and gods that they worshiped instead. And they sometimes did this so boldly, and, and I bring up Exodus because that's exactly what happened. See, in chapter 20, Moses is on a mountain with God himself, and he's receiving the Ten Commandments and all these other instructions about what it meant to be God's people and follow him. And this took a while. Even in, in scripture, there's, a, there's a, a, a several chapters where it just keeps going of God giving instruction and guidance. And we get to chapter 32, and he's drawing near to a conclusion. And the people that Moses was leading, the people of God that are waiting from this instruction, this, this instruction that came from the presence of God are getting impatient. And they go, hey, we don't know what's going on up there. We don't know what's happening we need something to worship, so let's create something to worship. And so they gather up all the gold that they had and they melted it down and they created a golden calf and they, they all sat and worshiped it. So Moses is up there on the mountain with God getting instructions on not to worship idols, comes down and the, the people are doing that very thing and they're worshiping idols. And this isn't a one-time thing, this is over and over and over again. And they continually went back to this temptation to worship and serve idols. And see, as you look through the Old Testament, as you read through Scripture, even the New Testament, we've seen this even in our study of 1 Corinthians of how do we deal with, with uh, you know, these pagan temples and the people that go there and food sacrifice to idols like we looked at a couple weeks ago. And I think the temptation for us is to look at this and go, well, this is a, a historical issue. We're modern day Americans. We don't have temples to Baal. We don't have Asherah poles and, and golden calves that are in our living room. This isn't an, an issue for us. But quite the opposite is true. As we look at our passage in 1 Corinthians today, we're gonna see that we're not immune from the risk of idolatry. Let's take a look now at 1 Corinthians 10. Let's see what Paul has to say for us in this issue. 1 Corinthians 10, verse one says this. He says, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and ate the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, 
With most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Let me pause there for a second. Paul's trying to establish, hey, your ancestors, some, some of them, their literal ancestors, for all of us, are spiritual ancestors. He's saying, hey, they were connected to God. They were following God. They saw God at work. They were seeing amazing and mighty things happening. And he says, and yet God wasn't pleased with them. And it's set up to go, hold on, why is that the case? Why is there a tension between them loving and seeing God at work and God having an attitude of of being pleased with them? He continues, verse six, he says, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. He says, don't be idolaters as some of them were. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's a a quote from Exodus 32 where they were worshiping that golden calf. Verse eight, it says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of all ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation, no temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man, and God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. He says, the why, why was God not pleased with these people who saw God at work, who were following him, and it's because they were worshiping idols. It's because they were, they were seeing what God was doing and yet they were choosing to say, well, maybe I'll worship and serve something else instead. And I think the, the situation here is so important. The, the, the context that these people were in is so important for us because we might even look at idolatry and go, well, that's something that non-believers do. That's some, not something I would do. That's something that the people who don't go to church, people who, who aren't interested in following Jesus, they're worshiping and serving idols. And yet here in 1 Corinthians, we're given this this warning from history of people who are the opposite. He used the the Israelites in the desert, people who escaped slavery in Egypt from divine intervention from God, who saw the Red Sea part so that they could walk across on dry land and escape the, the pursuing Egyptian armies. Is people who every day that they were in this season were guided by this massive pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night saying, of God saying, this is the direction to go. People who every day woke up and there was food called manna that God had miraculously provided. It was laying there for them as daily provision for their needs. People who saw miracles like water coming out of stone after Moses struck it so they could have fresh water to drink. Miracles like overthrowing armies that they never should have beaten. They saw God do all these amazing things. And yet over and over they fell into worshiping these cheap and pagan gods that were around them. And Paul's saying the warning for us is that we can be people who say, I love Jesus I've seen him change my life and my family's life. I worship him. I go to church. I'm involved in a life group. I do all these things. If we're not paying attention, we fall into that trap of worshiping and serving idols instead of worshiping God as our number one priority. And he's saying, you guys need to be aware of this danger that's before you that you may not even see. And the danger is that we can know and follow God and yet serve idols. And, it, and we have to know that this is a slow creep. This isn't something that we just wake up one day and decide to do, but this is something that, that happens slowly over time where we prioritize other things ahead of God in our life. And these might even be good things. These might be things that you go, well, well how is that bad? It, it's a good thing. But see, is it a good thing or is it a God thing? Because we can, we can put things ahead of God in our life that are good, things like our family. One that... that is probably a real danger for us, and that's the success in, in the, the accomplishment of our children, if you're parents. See, so we can worship things that become idols like our family, our career, our hobbies, our own success, our money, our toys, our devices, and that time we spend scrolling each day. It, idols can even be things like our comfort, our, our pleasure-seeking, our, our selfish living. 
It can be living to please people and worrying about appearances. To get more specific on that, ladies, your Pinterest perfect home might be an idol if you're more worried about what people think than, than how you're living your life. Guys, your perfectly detailed truck and boat might be an idol in your life. See, idols don't always have to be these evil, nasty-looking things. It can be things that are good things that just get moved up to that number one slot of priority above God. So the, the instruction from 1 Corinthians 10 here is to be aware that there's a risk here. This isn't something that we look at historically of, oh, this is a problem that we used to have in the old days of the Bible, but it's something that we're walking in present danger of today. And so as we process that, if we go, okay, this is a danger, what do we do with it? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10, picking up in verse 14. He says this, he says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one bread, we who are many body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? He says, what do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No. I imply that what pagans sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? See, this passage shows us that our response to idolatry is to flee. This is an active and aggressive response. This isn't passive. This isn't lazy and complacent. It's to flee, like running from your house being on fire, like running from things falling from the sky in your direction, to flee from idolatry. And maybe you're thinking, well, why is it so serious? Well, let's think back a little bit, because Paul says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I had a, a seminary professor who always said, whenever you see a therefore in scripture, you need to pause and figure out what the therefore was there for. See, you see that? I thought it was punny, so I remembered it. But, but it points us back. Him saying, therefore, because of what I've told you, flee from idolatry. What did he tell us? He told us that, that the people of Israel experienced pain and destruction and death because of their idol worship. He communicated that because they kept falling in this trap of idolatry, that it ruined their life, it drew them away from God, that it, it changed the direction of their nation, that the pain they experienced was because they didn't put God first in their life. And so he says that we need to flee from idolatry because of the destructive nature. And it's not just from, from that one time in the, the Exodus season of them being in the wilderness, but it's all of the history of the nation of Israel. If you read books like Judges or First and Second Kings, you see the, the, the big picture history of this nation and the cycle that took place throughout their history. They'd have good leadership and they'd prioritize God and serve and seek after God and they'd prosper and things would be great. And then there'd be a change of leadership and they'd serve other gods They'd worship things like Baal and Asherah, and all of a sudden their, their country would erode and have issues. And, you, and you'd look at it and go, man, why would they do that? Why would they leave the God of the Bible and, uh, and all the good things that were promised? And then you dig a little deeper in those pagan gods of Baal and Asherah. They were the, the, the frequent like pagan deities of that era. But they also promised sex and status for those who engaged with their worship. And all of a sudden, it really starts to make sense why it drew them away from worshiping God. So Paul says that we need to flee from idolatry because it's trying to destroy us. But he also says that we need to flee because it's incompatible with our union with Christ. See, he talks about this, this drinking of, of the cup and breaking the bread, and it's kind of cryptic in his analogies, but he's talking about communion. He's talking about Lord's Supper and how when we do that, when we take communion and, and drink the cup and remember Jesus' blood shed for us and break the bread and remember his body given for us, we're not only remembering his sacrifice, but we're also pledging our devotion and our commitment to following him. We're saying, hey, I'm aligned with you. I'm uniting my life to you in this moment. He's saying, how can we do that while also worshiping idols? 
Because anytime we're giving of ourselves and our worship, we're aligning ourselves with that other thing. He says you can't align yourself with Jesus and with an idol in your life at the same time. It's incompatible. So what do we do? How do we flee from idols? I have a couple thoughts on that. And the first is to simply live our life placing God as the highest priority. That's essentially what he's calling us to do here of of living our life where God is the most important thing in all of our priorities. And it's really simple, almost too simple. But like so many things in scripture, this is simple, but it's not easy because we're constantly evaluating priorities and thinking about stuff that we wanna do and, and, and what are we gonna focus on and what are we gonna give our time and our energy and our devotion to but it's simply an instruction to put Jesus as the first thing in our priority list. And what makes that difficult is there's other things in our priority list that we really like. Those things that, that maybe idols are there because we enjoy them, because we see value in them, because we like participating in them. And if we're going to flee from idolatry, we need to take an intentional and aggressive approach And there's some things that we have to fully remove from our life. If we're gonna follow this advice and say, I'm gonna flee from idolatry and focus on Jesus, there's some things that we have to leave behind. There's some things that we brought into our life. Maybe it's false teaching or some other new age or occult ideology. Maybe it's a destructive sin habit. Maybe there's there's some addiction to, to substances like alcohol or drugs. Maybe it's pornography or infidelity that's in our life that we go, hey, this is not compatible with me following Jesus. But maybe there's some harder things that we have to navigate. Things that we can't just say, well, I'm not gonna have this in my life anymore. Things like, well, what do we do when our family is an idol? What do we do when our career is an idol? What do we do when there's things that we can't just walk away from or an idol? That's where the hard work of, of putting Jesus as a higher priority there where we go, hey, it's great to care about our kids, but it can't be more important than my time with Jesus and, and leading my family to, to be committed followers of Christ. It's where we go, hey, it's, it's, it's a biblical imperative for me to work, but it doesn't mean that I have to put all of my identity and purpose and joy in my career. And maybe there's a career change or demotion that needs to take place to make sure that Jesus is more important than our jobs. See, if we want to flee from idolatry, we put Jesus as the number one thing in our life. But secondly, we need to be aware of the things that try and creep in. If you notice in verse 12, he says, hey, take heed lest you fall. He says, stay aware of those things that try to creep in. Be aware of those, those areas of your life where you feel like you're doing good, but all of a sudden there's an idol that creeps in. And this is good because it's a reminder of how we get to that place of worshiping idols. We don't put it on the calendar and say, hey, on Tuesday the 16th, I'm gonna start worshiping idols and we have like a countdown on our wall. We don't wake up on on one day and say, you know what, today's the day I'm gonna stop caring about following Jesus as the most important thing. But it's a series of slow decisions, of gradual decisions and choices that lead us away from prioritizing Christ in our life and prioritizing other things. And he says, hey, pay attention because when you feel like you're in the place of, oh, I would never do that. I would never worship idols, that wouldn't happen. That's the point where we're most prone for failure, he says. So I think all of us need to be aware and be asking ourselves, what's the most important thing in my life? And if the answer is anything but Jesus, that's our point to say, hey, something needs to change. And and there's another thing that I've noticed to to help identify where there might be idols. And and I I learned a while ago that idols are most easily identified when they're threatened. When someone steps on your idol or threatens to take it away or or you have a choice between your life uh, of following Jesus and your life of, of worshiping that idol, that's when they're really prevalent. Those moments when you have a really strong response to a seemingly simple situation might indicate that there's an idol. Like guys, when you get really angry about your kids dropping a French fry in your, the back seat of your truck and you just get irate, it might be that your truck's an idol. Or parents, if you feel the need to scream and cuss out your, your kid's coach or referee at your sports event, it might be that your kid's success or sports career is an idol. 
if one bad photo or your, your wardrobe getting messed up ruins your entire day and throws you off, it might be that vanity is an idol in your life. See, where we have these strong, aggressive response to seemingly simple and little situations shows that either there's a, a trigger there that we need to unpack in counseling or that there's an idol that we need to be at work fleeing from. So today, I think we need to ask, hey, where are there idols in my life? And are we fleeing from them or are we protecting them and defending them? But it would be remiss if we didn't end this sermon by also saying that as we think about this topic of idolatry, we also need to remember that grace is available. See, we, my, my motivation, my primary motivation in this sermon is to say, hey, idolatry isn't some historical thing. It's a present risk in our life that we need to be aware of. But secondly, that this wouldn't lead us to a place of feeling like failures and, and feel like, oh, we're just not good enough, but to point us to the fact that Jesus is there waiting for us with grace, with forgiveness, with second chances. That instead of going, oh, I need to try harder or do more, it's no, you need to love Jesus greater in your life. You need to flee to him and, and spend time at his feet saying, hey, you're the most important thing in my life. And I love that in the midst of this, Paul brings up communion as that reminder that Jesus died for us. That he died for us as people who are prone to wander and serve other things than Jesus. As people who are prone to rebel and sin against him. And that Jesus died for us even while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8 tells us. And that he died so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have a restored relationship to him and so that we could have our life cleansed of the sin that we commit. And so anytime we find ourselves and we go, man, I think I've prioritized something other than Jesus. Or anytime we go, man, I've gotten really busy in my life and I don't know the last time I've spent time with God. I don't know the last time I've prayed or spent time reading scripture or really connecting with him because I've been worshiping all this other stuff. Then we need to remember that he's there waiting for us with open arms, full of grace and love because he wants us to follow him. But we have a choice to make. Are we gonna worship and serve him or are we gonna worship and serve the other things that interject our life over and over and over again? Paul's given us a warning here. He's, he's, he's raised the warning flag of an area of our life spiritually. He says, hey, pay attention here because there's something trying to destroy you. But we have to decide what's gonna be most important in our life. Is it gonna be the things of this world that we enjoy, that, that we've created, that we've put at that top priority? Is it going to be Jesus? But know today that God's calling you to flee from idols and to pursue him with everything that you have. Let's pray. God, I thank you for sections of scripture that, that guide us and instruct us. I thank you for the reminder that you haven't left us to figure out this life alone, but you're wanting to walk with us in that to help us navigate situations that maybe we're not even seeing as a risk in our life. And God, I pray that we would live as people who are constantly seeking to flee from idols. That we're living as people saying, hey, I, I need to prioritize Jesus above everything else in my life so that we can live the life that you've created us to, so that we could have a proper understanding of what it means to be worshipers. And that the, the outlet, the destination, the focus of our worship is Jesus and him alone. God, we know that we're prone to wandering, to failing, to, to filling so many other things with that top priority slot in our life. So God, help us to see quickly, to flee even faster, and to constantly be people who fall at the base of the cross saying, hey, here I am, laying down my idols, my sin, my shame, and picking up the purpose and joy and grace that is available for me in Christ. God, we love you. Help us to love and follow you greater. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Simply put, idolatry is worshiping and serving anything above God. And whether we recognize it or not, when we prioritize things of this world ahead of God, we practice idolatry. Like the title of the sermon, we should flee from idols. In an effort to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, we post daily three to five minute devotional videos on our Facebook and YouTube accounts. You can sign up to receive them by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash Devo. That's D-E-V-O. Well, that'll do it for today. Have a terrific week and we'll be back next weekend. Bye-bye.